Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final Q&A. We have a whole bunch of the speakers here. And I will start with the first question in the question box, which is from Ann Barker. She says, I thought this morning really highlighted the challenge we have in incorporating and moving evolutionary theory and evolution into the practical world of diagnosing and treating cancer patients. I see this as the next valley of death in oncology. How can we become proactive in moving evolution to become next to oncology, to build the bridges into oncology? So uh, whichever speakers want to take that one, raise your hand and the tech people will put you on. Frank, go ahead. Frank, you want to say something? Oh, okay. Well, did I raise my hand? I guess I've been volunteered. Um, well, of course, we, we don't have uh, Dennis and Jim and Henry and a few others on this particular panel, but um, we think there is a, not only an organismal evolution, there is an, an extended uh, or new framework of organismal evolution. I, I think there are some new elements uh, and there perhaps, you know, perhaps there's different layers of short-term versus longer-term evolution in, in cancer evolution as well. But it seemed to me, well, we may not have a consensus anymore of what the evolution is, but the previous consensus was not quite correct. Somatic mutation theory alone doesn't cut it. That's become totally clear with so much empirical data. It's, of course, still a part of the equation. So I think, and, uh, I, I think we need to work on conceptually on the theory and, and the concept and framework of cancer and evolution. I don't think we're done at the end of this conference. We just write it up, but I think we've made a lot of conceptual progress now. So, you know, and uh, granted, I think that that poses some challenge. I wish we had complete com uh, agreement, consensus and conceptual agreement. We, we don't, but at least we're not stuck in a something that's only partially true. And I think we're actually not very far from something that could be refined and, and, and summarized, and then maybe, you know, 80% of us would agree with it. You'll never get 100% agreement. So I'm, I'm more optimistic. Uh, I see that Natalia has her hand raised. Let's hear from you, Natalia. Yes, uh, what I want to add uh, is the following. We are now bringing up a new generation of scientists who have uh, a, a wide range of skills that uh, cover both um, web lab methods, uh, uh, biological methods, and co uh, computational, mathematical, and quantitative methods of studies. And I think uh, uh, this population of uh, new scientists uh, will help us make uh, a lot of breakthroughs because the collaboration between mathematicians and uh, biologists uh, is not easy. We don't necessarily speak each other's language, but uh, we have to collaborate in order to truly understand uh, the complicated evolutionary processes that happen in cancer. In my view, evolution is a branch of mathematics. In your view, it's a branch of biology. We need those new scientists to put us together and uh, to uh, really bring evolution to the forefront of uh, oncology. I think Elizabeth had her hand up first. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, so great question, Anna. And, you know, so how I'm, I'm framing it is how do we integrate like evolution and cancer treatment? And I'll build off what Natalia said. I think that's important is that we start to tackle this from like a multifaceted approach. And I don't think it's just marrying together biologists with, you know, data scientists or mathematicians, but it's always also bringing the clinicians sort of directly into the conversation as well, so that these terms are fully sort of integrated into their, their common vernacular, um, which is something I think we need to do. You know, and I think about cancer and evolution and, and, you know, we have come a long way and how we can make that even better and not get stuck in that valley of death that you're talking about. You know, obviously I might seem biased, but I think it's by embracing diagnostics and biomarkers, right? We've already acknowledged that there are much better ways to diagnose cancer based on genomic RNA-seq phosphoproteomic metabolite, you know, biomarkers, but I think we cannot stop there and acknowledge cancer is not a static disease. It's constantly mutating. It's constantly evolving. And if we 
continue to then develop and bring to market, you know, diagnostic tools that let us stay one step ahead. That's how we can avoid kind of getting caught in that bottleneck. Um, Bonnie. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that was a really good point, Elizabeth. And I think that when you look at the um, financial bell-shaped curve that isn't very bell-shaped on where in the space money goes, it uh, is overwhelmingly a high percent on patients with late stage disease because that's where the drugs can be developed and tried first. Yet to change the patient outcome curve, we need to put a lot more money on the very front end so that we can find patients early and move them out of that circle of the valley of death personally and focus the attention then on those patients that are advanced, which should be reduced over time if we do a better job of early diagnosis. Steve. Yeah, I think one of the interesting challenges we have ahead is now we're, we're getting better at uh, predictive biomarkers and things like that. But the challenge is that in many, many of the cancers or even other diseases, you only have two or three choices of what to give someone, even in combination. We're starting to see agents that are working across many cancers, and we're going to start to see successes in terms of all the different technologies. And so when you think about evolution, evolution responds to any external stress. You know, we think with very simple minded with regard to antibiotics. But now when you start to throwing so many variables in terms of different therapies at it and trying to understand exactly what the outcome is going to be in the long term, we're going to need more of these mathematical models, the complexity of understanding all the different biological systems to truly invent or to create what is going to work in an ongoing and developing way for most people. So I think it's going to be exciting. And, and thankfully, there's a lot of smart people behind us. I'm going to jump us to another comment here, and I would like uh, the faculty to uh, to chime in. Um, William Ade says, the revision of thinking needs to start in medical school. And what I would like to ask the faculty is, what do you think you can do even without changing your entire administration um, along these lines? Who, who would like to? Okay, Jin Song Lu. So, uh, you know, I would like to address those questions. You know, I see so many uh, exciting talks in high technology and uh, omics studies and uh, machine learning, which is, they're all very good. But I think we can probably do dig into some basic concept in the medical schools, which address those questions. As you see, the cancer biology and pathology who make diagnosis of cancer actually in a living a totally different world. And then most people just diagnose, you know, make a gene, knock out, and also, uh, you know, doing all those tissue culture studies. And then they never say what does cancer look like. So we already addressed those, you know, some of those questions during my talk in cancer diagnosis. And then pathologists make a decision. If a pathology is wrong, all the subsequent treatment is wrong. So this is not something you can take very lightly and seriously. But in cancer biology, everybody has a different system. Say I'm working on cancer. Nobody really, really try to understand what is a pathology there? What is really cancer? There is very little training understand what is the basics of pathology and oncology. So I think there is a huge, you know, you know, gap between pathology and the, uh, you know, science now. Okay, so just something very, very simple. All right, the gene is not the cancer. Genome is not a cancer. The criteria I describe it, that's what we use. Those simple concepts, if we can get into everybody's mind, what is real cancer, I think it will make a much better crisis in fighting cancer. Jin Sung, I am reminded of the famous Vince Lombardi uh, on the first day of his team. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> and, and sometimes we have to reset our knowledge down to that level. 
That's right. I said, gentlemen, what is cancer? This is cancer on the microscope. You need to look at the microscope. Right now, our next generation science has lost the basic ability to observe what is cancer. Also, uh, Perry, just to add to what you said, uh, Rene Magritte, the great surrealist artist. This is not a pipe, he said. This is the picture of a pipe. This is not a pipe. <laughs> I love that painting by him. <laughs> and so, uh, Jin Song, absolutely, you nailed it. We really have not been talking about uh, cancer in all its uh, complexity. And one of uh, the things that I uh, pointed out in my book, which people take Umbrajet, which they shouldn't, is that uh, here what has happened is that people are studying, scientists are studying a disease they never see in animals who don't get it. <laughs> well, uh, this is something that's very, very fundamental. You really need to look at what is a cancer before you can start working on cancer. Otherwise, we're just working a bunch of genes, a bunch of pathways, and then at the end of the day, you know, what is the cancer? Nobody knows. And the question I ask is how many people have sat and cataloged the night sweats in a mouse? Mm. Yeah, this is something very, very fundamental, and when come back to medical schools. There's a theme in the chat box around needing to break interdisciplinary boundaries. Um, I have a story about that. I have a friend named Emerson Sparks. He started the world's, uh, the biggest Harry Potter fan site when he was 12. He's a child prodigy. He's now in his 30s and he's, he's wealthy and he spends all his time just studying things. And he said, whenever I go into a new field, um, it takes me about 20 hours of digging through the scientific literature and everything to sort of figure out what's going on and who the experts are. And he says, eventually I find somebody who, who then takes me farther in one hour than the previous ones took me in 20. And he says, what I've always noticed about that person is that they are they are an expert on not one, but maybe five different disciplines, and they know how to s explain all five in plain English. And he called that person an interdisciplinary explainer. Um, I've had about five different careers, and I would say that the, the number one thing that I have noticed about people who make breakthroughs is it is the chiropractor walks across the street to a bowling alley and he says, hey, these guys are doing something that nobody in my industry does. Let's go do that. And that, that is what I am also noticing about the really extraordinary people. Jin Song Liu, um, if you looked at his slides, he's bridging, um, I, I don't even want to screw up the terminology, pathology, cancer, embryology, same thing with Michael Levin. Um, I think one of the most important things all of us can do is read outside of our fields and talk to people outside of our specialties. Sometimes somebody outside our specialty knows in five minutes that we're totally going down a blind alley. Um, so um, let's see. I, I, I had a comment. Yeah. Me, yeah, I mean, that last point, I couldn't agree more. The, the, the problem I have with science and, and biomedical research is that it's so siloed. Um, and the system is set up in many ways to discourage collaboration. It rewards an individual and not a group of scientists that can bring a, a series of different technologies or a way of thinking to the table. Um, and that often discourages collaboration. It discourages young scientists or um, uh, younger people from getting involved in this type of collaboration. So I would argue we'd have to, we need to kind of flip the reward system to encourage people to come together. And the point about, yeah, cancer is in genes, but wouldn't it be fantastic can, to connect scientists working on the genes with the cl clinic? I mean, that's the goal of this, right? And so you tell the medical students, look, you guys got to learn about the molecular underlying biology behind the cancer. And then you talk about the people in the labs. Well, you guys got to get a better handle on the clinical side of things. So in my mind, it's bringing the different people together. And at a high level, we need to flip the system around and, and facilitate that and reward people that are working in di different disciplines to come together. That's where the big breakthroughs through that, the chiropractor and the bowling, bowling alley example. So 
I, mean, I really, I, I really agree with that in terms of the uh, leaders in the scientific fields. Converting that into medical education, though, is uh, is yet another challenge. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that unfortunately, those kind of synthetic communicators who can speak to multiple disciplines, integrate them, and speak plainly are, are you know, in relatively short supply. Right? They are the really gifted uh, clinicians and teachers. And the vast majority of medical education is done by people who don't necessarily have those skills, um, who are very often busy with other things, who you know, give the same lecture or a series of lectures uh, with the same sort of formalisms that they've given for years. So you know, getting back to the idea of medical education and, and uh, evolution in cancer, I think it's pretty clear to most medical students these days with the information that they're provided that cancer is an evolutionary <clears throat> system but not with all of these kind of advanced formalisms of evolution that we've been hearing about over the past three days. Um, and, uh, you know, those are, uh, unless a very concerted effort is made uh, to kind of, uh, you know, broaden the horizons of uh, medical students in those specific topics, I think it's, it's going to be a very slow process. But um, I do think that the idea that you have to tell medical students that they need to think broadly, that they need to be trying to break down barriers and that they need to resist uh, the siloing of their education um, is is probably one of the most central themes that we can really offer uh, in medical but education. But Michael, it's not the medical students' fault. It's us only. No. It's our fault. We are not breaking down the barriers. We are the ones who are so sclerotic in our thinking and ossified and petrified. We are the ones who, who are squashing their creativity. So yeah. I don't think we should be only talking about educating the young. We need to really make a change in the older generation. This is very true. I, you know, my experience has been that when, when I give a talk, I can always tell what department I'm in based on which part of the talk makes people angry. And it's always a different part because things you can say in one department are completely obvious. And you say the same thing in another department and they throw tomatoes. And it's like, okay, but you guys, there's, you know, you're right next to each other on the same floor. Why is the same concept totally obvious to neuroscientists, but completely, you know, sort of anathema in molecular genetics and vice versa, right? These are, so we have to get that straight before the students can join us in, in these kind of ideas. Michael, I have a question for you. Yeah. Why do you have more books than me? We can count, we can count them later. I, I just totally agree with all you said. It is probably our, you know, fault, faculty. Even for me, it took me almost the entire ten years to penetrate, to penetrate through barriers like embryology. It's something so obvious. After you say that, say, look, you know, if you think it's a new life, don't you think you should know normal embryology? But simply nobody pay attention to a normal embryology. It's just that right there. If you look at the pathology, every embryology developmental step, you have a tumor. But our pathologist colleagues most focus on individual tumors. They did not think how cancer biology they're doing. Cancer biology, they work on gene and the genome. And then we know when we go to cancer biology department, we have to praise oncogenes and suppressor genes. Otherwise, you you know you're not going to welcome them as a guest as a speakers. So you know, so this kind of thing, it is our fault. It is our generations. Another thing I want to emphasize: it is probably it's a system, because if you do not work on gene, you do not work uh, or, or you know popular ideas, your grant will not be get funded. So you're pretty much, you know, it's gonna die early during early stage of career. So thanks God I started to think about this after I get my professorship tenure. If I work on these kind of ideas during my 10 years, first 10 years career, probably I never get the, you know, my tenure probably out of a job. And then another thing is I'm lucky because I'm a pathologist. At least I can look the slides and make a career. Otherwise, for many basic scientists, very difficult to uh, do this kind of uh, interdisciplinary and you know, try to penetrate into the barrier to, to make the career. So this is something we have to fix from very beginning, the system we have to, unless we fix system, we pretty much waste uh, a lot of money trying to do cancer research. Jin Song, in more crass terms, this thing is called paycheck oncology. <laughs> Everybody Which means that if your paycheck is going to depend 
on this, then uh, that's what you're going to toe the line. You're going to have to do it. And that's the system we need to break. That's this right. is why you can only speak up when you have tenure. Why? Because now your paycheck doesn't depend upon it. Yeah. And this is exactly a very important point to make here. But this is coming back to empowering the youth. We have to empower the yes. youth with the best ideas. And, you know, I'm always blaming the system. I like Azar. We should be blaming ourselves. We need to be putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions. Yes. Too often, we're like, oh, we get tenure. We're complacent. We're comfortable. We're not going to push the boundaries. Why? We should be pushing the boundaries and setting precedent and setting examples for the young scientists and say, you constantly have to be putting yourself in uncomfortable positions because that's how you learn and you grow, right? And that's how you make the big breakthroughs. Natalie, let's hear from you. Uh, I, I have an explanation of why it is so difficult to break these barriers. It's really uh, an evolutionary problem. <laughs> we have evolved in such a way that we speak with those who are most like ourselves. We uh, function very well in small groups, uh, uh, in communities of individuals that uh, kind of think alike. If you look at, uh, um, you know, graphs of uh, citations, you know, you've probably seen those. They are like clumps of people who always cite each other, but never uh, between groups. So we have evolved to stick with our community. And I think the first step uh, in breaking this uh, evolutionary, you know, programming is to, aware, is to be aware of the problem. And this is exactly why we're talking about it here. We are aware that there is a problem and that's the first step in breaking it. Um, Tao Wu says, maybe NIH needs to break the study section and Ken Pienta said, dream on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Perry, some, I just read a question and somebody mentioned that uh, Norbert Wiener who um, created uh, cybernetics out of a multidisciplinary conference. I want to tell a, just a very brief story about cybernetics because we recently, uh, two, three years ago, we had put together uh, a conference on cybernetics. And I opened my talk with this, uh, with this story, which is famous about uh, Norbert, that when he died and went to heaven, there was one younger person who had died and gone to heaven. And then he was questioned okay, we will grant you one wish uh, uh, before we send you to heaven. So what is your wish? And, and Norbert said, look, in life, no one understood what I meant by cybernetics. Can I give uh, one more lecture before I am sent off to, sorry, to hell? Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so the guy said, yes, yes, you can give a lecture and uh, we'll let you go to heaven. But let me ask this other guy. The other one was a young student and he said, uh, no, I am a Norbert student. Kill me and please send me to hell first. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we have Steve Goins and then Frank. Okay. I, I just want to steer a little bit in a different direction. I think Michael's on target was talking about the communication of uh, faculty and things, but that we have a mutation that's arisen in society now. It's called the anti-science rhetoric. Uh, and uh, I teach, I speak a lot to lay audiences, although not truly lay when you look at who the makeup is. Uh, they just don't know any biology or medicine. And uh, I also teach in bioethics courses uh, to often around the world. The audiences come in virtually now. And what I discover is that uh, while we, we live in a silo of understanding science, we don't understand the outside world and we don't spend a minute trying to communicate how science can work. So we're going to go into an era of even greater complexity of language and medicine and everything else. So this divide could be, grow larger. I do find that physicians in particular, they already have a trust, but even, even graduate students, every class I teach, I charge the audience with, it is your job, because you're now as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable than your neighbors to advocate for what you think is right. Do not be silent. And so I think giving students an experience, and even in the bioethics stuff, I learned stuff from around the world that just shocks me. Uh, about how the different ethical uh, landscapes exist. Giving students even a case study or some experience that says, you too have a voice that is not embedded in the arcane acronyms of oncology. It's a voice about the world, 
how is that coming to an end and how we can trust the people who are leading it. And I think that would be a very good message because students just don't see enough of that. Certainly don't see it today at all. And I'll be blunt in the leadership of the science community. There has not been enough people standing up to act on behalf of science for science in a lay context. I want to quick tell us tell a story on Jim Shapiro before we go to Frank. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Jim's breakfast area with him and Joan one day, and Jim was talking about the hard slog of pushing new ideas out there. And he said, well, Jim, that's what you get for being 25 years ahead of your time. And Joan looks over and she goes, 30. <laughs> uh, Frank. Yeah, I, I wanted to not talk about cancer, but actually about the symposium. I think we've, uh, we've uh, there, there has been a some degree, I think all the speakers here have attended a symposium and spoken at a symposium that was a little uncomfortable. I think it went really well, but when I looked at all the topics and the mix of people we brought together, I think everybody was, I'll speak for myself, a little bit outside of their comfort zone and not only talking to the usual suspects, the usual group. So I think not only the organizing and the advisory committee, but really all the speakers, there's sort of a, in some ways, a, 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 some, some element of leadership that we all, you know, not, I'm not here to applaud ourselves, but, but we've reached out, we, we were 30 speakers. We were able to attract about 250 participants that were probably in and out, probably not everybody listened to the full three days, but maybe some selected, some may have been here for the full three days. Um, we're not quite ready to go to, you know, 3 million students and, and that, that study that undergraduate science students and tell them yet what the outcome is, because a lot of things are in flux. We're on the steep, I was on the steep part of my learning curve. I suspect just about everybody who participated for three days in certain talks was on the extremely steep part of the learning curve. I think we need to continue with what we've started here, whether that's as a standalone cancer and evolution society or becoming integrated in SMBE or, or something else that remains to be debated. That's for later. And I think we need to provide continued leadership, continued interdisciplinary outside of everybody's usual comfort zone work. If we want to make progress, not only in cancer and evolution, but ultimately of course in, in cancer as a population phenomenon for individual patients. So I think it's a very good start. We've had a factor of 10 multiplier, maybe over the next year, we can reach 2,500 people. If I think about all the invitations I send out, people that didn't look at this, they looked at the website and said, oh, this is weird, or I don't have time for this, or I only care for the one or two talks, and I know already what they're saying, because I know these people. You know, maybe we can get to 2,500 people over the next year, and then maybe someday we'll be ready for 25,000 people that are studying in med school and want to become oncologists. We're not quite ready yet, but I think we should continue on this path. How many of you would be relieved, speakers, uh, would be relieved to hear that it's okay if you only understood a third of a bunch of presentations? Would uh, I, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you not the, the participants can't see all the hands because we got this other Zoom room, but yeah, it's like most people are like, I mean, I was t texting back and forth with a couple of my like uh, lay friends who were attending the conference and th like, they thought I understood all of this. I'm like, no, no, um, I got the gist of most of it, but you know, it's okay. Like, in fact, after a while you get, you get used to taking 10 or 20% of what you can pull out of something and synthesizing something with it. And, and that's incredibly useful. You don't have to understand every slide. You don't have to understand every, every, um, I, I've got a question here from Michael. He says- Can I just make a commentary on what Frank said? I think it's a very important idea that he has floated about forming some sort of a formal group or society my only concern with these is the old Greek concept of kiklos, 
where you start with very good democratic principles, we want to get together, but very soon the society will get taken over by an oligarchy and very soon it becomes an autocracy. And then it's got all those, uh, those problems that the Greeks have been describing for 2000 plus years. Mm. I feel very concerned about those kinds of things. Maybe, Frank, we should start thinking on more open models because investing three full days to this conference has been a lot of time commitment on my part also. I had to do three extra clinics in the last uh, three weeks in order to make up for this week. And it has been quite a, uh, quite a uh, chaotic thing because I needed to free up the whole day, each day. And so I think uh, the Zoom ability to have cyber connections has provided us with so many new platforms that let's start thinking a little more creatively. And this is where the younger people have to step in and tell us what to do. But I'm very much for the idea of continuing the enthusiasm of the present group and inviting more and more people from across disciplines to start joining us. And you will be surprised that when you uh, send out the invitation, maybe hundreds of people will want to join in terms of medical students, fellows and residents in training is what I'm talking about. I've got several um questions in the chat box of what should we be removing from science or medical education anybody um probably stop the can i comment yes i think what the most of medical school should uh, start is to start to say what is a dogma. Define various dogmas, what has been there did not correlate with clinical observation. I studied with a slide say, everybody comes to mechanism, very specific pathway, single molecule, but you really, many of the things did not correlate what we see in patients, right? Dr. Raza said, you know, first day, say most patients do not have a progression. This just happened one time. So when I into look at the pathology, when you look at the dogmas, right? Vogelstein colon progression. When I look at ovarian cancer, benign is benign, malignant is malignant. They have no progression, but everybody dogma is the by that the colon progression models, those things they should be removed. And also at the least that you know, this did not correlate with a clinical observation. Malignant, benign, many cases do not progress to malignant. But right now, since everybody, you know, have read that paper now and everybody become medical school textbook. So we have to, at the medical school student know from the very beginning, some of those documents, some of those principles, and then is not correlated what we see in real clinical situation, particularly in pathology. So those kind of things should be removed from the very, very beginning. I have a quick anecdote. This is Steve, if I could comment. In the late 80s, Dean Tostas at Harvard Medical School went to the new pathway to way of teaching, and I was there at the time. And he, just, he decided that there would be no afternoon classes. It was a good, uh, for the first year students, it was a good opportunity for them to pursue their passion, whether it was playing piano or serving the, the needy or anything else. And so that in, what ensued was a huge fight among the faculty because we now eliminated about one third of all classes in terms of what organs are we not gonna teach? What uh, biochemical pathway we're we going to avoid? Well, you hear nothing about that today. They still skip afternoon classes. And somehow we've had doctors over the last 40 years, so or, th or 30 years. So I'm not sure that it's really that hard. I think it's the fiefdoms and the silos that live because it, it, the standing joke was at the end of the second year, they have to pass an exam and they all do, <laughs> so, even with half the number of class hours. So they will find, just like we are in the new economy, finding these uh, boot camps and everything else, you will find the skill you need to do the job that you're passionate about. Anybody else on what we should cut out? I'll just mention somebody asked in the chat box, what about videos? We have a YouTube channel for Cancer and Evolution Symposium. 
and those videos are going to go on that YouTube channel and in very short order on the, on the homepage of cancerevolution.org. We already have a bunch of PowerPoint presentation PDFs already linked. We will add links to most of the videos. There's a few speakers that did not want their stuff to be put up because it's embargoed for future publication, but um, most, uh, most of the presentation will be available within the next couple of days and you can share it with your friends.